Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. Pressure allows you to rewire your brain, to get this part of your brain denser so you can cope with more leading on. However, you need to understand what that pressure is, where it sits, when you have it, uh, the landscape of it, and then how to recover from it. All of a sudden, it meant that the tough days were meant to be there. I was working that part of my brain. Okay, good. I'm having a shit day. Brilliant. (laughs) Bring it on. What are you doing? Today, I'm talking to Leslie Patterson, a former world champion triathlete who's represented Great Britain and has a dozen medals, who's also a film producer with an Oscar-winning film under her belt. Having started competing in triathlons aged just 16, Leslie combined her competing with a degree and then masters in drama. Her triathlon career has not been without setbacks though, having contracted Lyme's disease in her 30s and famously winning one triathlon with a shoulder she'd broken just the day before. That particular experience dovetailed neatly with her passion for drama and her most recent triumph as screenwriter and producer of the multi-award winning Netflix film, All Quiet on the Western Front, made despite, or perhaps because of, countless pressures. In our conversation, Leslie shares what she learnt as a child from being the only girl playing rugby with 250 boys, the importance of physically connecting to the land, the mud and the dirt, and why she was glad she'd done her one-arm swimming training. Leslie, I am so excited to have you in this conversation uh, because huh, I just said to you earlier, you know, I've literally been stalking you since I first read your story, thinking this is the woman that I need to get on this podcast because, my God, the pressure she is not only dealing with but has dealt with um, has got to be heard. So uh, thank you for arriving, and I'm really excited about it. Oh, Sarah, it's an honour. I know it's been a little bit for us to uh, try and figure out our schedules and do this, but uh, yeah, it's great to chat and it uh, sounds like you've got some cool listeners out there. Yes, well, I have. And I'm also um, really trying to unpick people's relationships with pressure. And I know that you, well, I'm I'm not going to predict what you're going to say, but what I would love to start with is how would you actually Describe your relationship with pressure, Leslie. Um, I seek it out. And I think I've always sought it out. Uh, I like to pressure, being under pressure is um, feeling uncomfortable. I love to feel uncomfortable because I feel like it pushes my boundaries and it makes me discover something new about myself. Um, And there's a tension. There's a tension. And I love to be in that world of tension. Not all the time. I have to be very careful uh, that I don't overdo it. Uh, so I know my trigger points and I know how to recover. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely have a relationship where I, I, I seek it out. But she's both good and bad, right? Um, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> but how, how did you first forge that relationship that feels so like, I mean, you said you seek it. Have you always sought it out? I mean, when did it first hit you that, oh, this is a yep. this is a relationship that I, I love? Do you know, I think from a very, very young age, I mean, I was kind of competing from the age of four. I loved the sense, I, I think um, I loved to push to the edge I loved, I loved the joy. You know, you don't really feel happiness until you felt sad. And I think it's the um, that kind of model of things I could relate to from a very young age. I had to suffer before I had pleasure. Um, and that's maybe the Calvinistic aspect uh, of my DNA being Scottish. Um <laughs> You know, or or it's just the deficit model. I just it's how my my world, my mind ticks. It makes sense to me uh, that I can't truly experience something joyful unless something has been painful 
in some regard. Okay. Um, so you can you can kind of take that to any level or any extreme or not extreme. Um, it seems to be how my own brain works. And did did you get that predominantly from sport? Because I know that you, you know you you are a professional triathlete, and that's been part of your life. But I think did you start with rugby when you were very small? I did, I did. And here's the funny thing: is I went to uh, a rugby team in, in Scotland, and it was 250 boys and me. I was the only girl in the whole of Scotland that was playing. Lime. And I, I kind of sought it out. I remember going to watch my brother and I saw all these boys in the dirt and I thought, there's no girls here. Like, I want to do this. I want to prove to the world that I can do this. And so I think that was both the sense of I wanted to be special and different. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's being one of four. I'm the youngest of four. So you kind of want to push yourself forward and be heard. Um, so maybe that's the genesis of it um, and then the sense that something is difficult and there's adversity felt good I was drawn to that so you know and again that was at the age of seven I mean how do I you know that's that's the needs that's in your being isn't it yeah or or maybe you just saw lots of people who were drawn to it so you wanted to be part of it. I'm just really like so many people I talk to are not drawn to pressure. <laughs> like, you know, yes, uh, they yes. might deal with it, but they're not necessarily, they don't seek it particularly. Although I think on some level they do. And I, but this idea of you learning so young to seek it out, right. it's very interesting. I think um, there's something very primal about it and maybe that's why the sports that I chose certainly early on and even now were very much in the land and in the landscape and in the dirt and in the mud and very physical Mm. Uh, there was there was just a sense of being at one at peace with yourself um you know I don't know if you'd call that some kind of existential crises um, you know, even from a young age, right, you're trying to sort of find where you sit in the world or what makes sense to you or what gives you peace or what gives you meaning. Mm-hmm. And the physicality of being out there and um, experiencing the landscape and searching and sweating, but, but it's just a sensation, a feeling. Um, I can't even, I can't express it any more than that, but I, I, I was drawn to that. The thought of muscles working, bodies moving, you know, um, yeah, I just, there was there was a sensation that yeah. I thought out. And that was in the physical sense, but then on the emotive sense, on the creative world, I love to be in touch with my emotions. Mm. Um, my first creative endeavour was in dancing, it was in ballet and modern dance. Oh, is it? And I love to be in touch with my soul physically. Again, it's yeah. that physical dynamic, right? So I think yeah. maybe that's where I sorted it out initially. And then that felt good. And so I then started to seek it out in other areas of my life. And that sounds like it's pretty important throughout your life and still is, even though you've now got a whole other part of your life, which is highly creative. And I, I can't help but reflect as you talk about that, that the film that you've made and you've had such a success with, which is hard, but unbelievable to watch, by the way, is physical, right? Like that's a really like, you talk about in the, in the earth, in the mud, in the, in the toughness of it. It's that's so primeval, isn't it? Very much so. Very much so. I think it's, I think I was so drawn to that landscape of World War One because it's visceral. It's incredibly visceral. It's beautiful. It's tragic. It's a sandbox where you can investigate the deep uh, meaning of life <laughs> and investigate character emotions, the psychology of people, what happens in those circumstances, the why behind it all. That's yeah. the stuff that really fascinates me. Yeah. And I, I think what really struck me about your story was this dogged resilience over a 16-year period of something that actually you fundamentally believed in so much that you were never going to let it drop. Uh, can, you, can you 
talk to me about how you marry that sort of, I've heard you talk about, you know, the why, why it really matters to you. How do you keep that alive when things are so tough along the way? You know, I think it's a, it's a feeling, right? Um, it comes down to a sense of something. And I would only have to watch a really good war song or a film that really... It, it wouldn't even have to be a war song, a film that meant something, that said mm. something important, that moved me to tears, that would keep me on that trajectory of I have to tell this story. Because it's it's ultimately about the impact of storytelling and the impact of film as a medium yeah. has been profound in my development as a person. That I want to have that impact as a storyteller. So every step of the way, if ever I was sad or frustrated, or only had to watch a good film or watch a couple of the scenes, or watch a collaboration, listen to a director talk about a vision or a writer or or, 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 and it will keep me on path. So like, I have to make this. I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting uh, how people keep that purpose energy so central, so, so, so sort of at the heart of every choice you make along the way. Um, it, 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 it shone out when I listened to you talk about the power of that energy for you, as well as the physical. Um, stretch that you run alongside it almost. I mean, you literally ran it a lot. You <laughs> ran alongside the idea of keeping the money coming in every year through your athletic brilliance in order to keep your dream <laughs> of this creative story that needed to be spoken out in the world. These these two forces seem unbelievably strong when they run together. Yep. Well, they're they're curiously similar. And I think a lot of people don't think that sports and, and, and film are similar in terms of, you know, a career. But I think I've been successful in sport because I've been creative. Because if you want to have a long career, you have to be dynamic. You have to be flexible. You have to think outside the box. You have to be creative with how you are constructing your training program, your approach, your attacks, the whole thing. And, um, you know, I dealt with chronic Lyme disease, a lot of injuries. Yeah. I constantly had to pivot. And it was the creativity that kept me true to that. And, um, you know, and, 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 and kept me being able to do that. And equally, the discipline and the structure in sport, you know, so much of certainly endurance sport when it comes to success is, you have to break things up into manageable chunks. You have to understand the, the neurobiology of your brain and how it works, how dopamine works, how motivation works. So segmentation is a huge piece of sport. Yeah. You know, if you've got a six-hour training day, which is every day, and you're having to cut every minute of that, reposition yourself, if it's not going well, if it is going well, you know, you're having to sort of say, okay, I've got two minutes left on this, and then I'm going to change my attitude, or then I'm going to this, or then I'm going to that. You're constantly navigating that landscape into into separate goals. So that's part of my brain that's been wired to be like that. You know, and that, and that's the thing with your brain. You 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 have to earn resilience. You you, you can't learn it. So, and there's a part of your brain, this is what's been wonderful for me is being married to a psychologist and he really taught me a lot of this. There's a part of your brain that sits behind your eyes called your anterior cingulate cortex, your ACC. And it actually processes emotional and physical pain. And um, as we deal with tough scenarios, that part of our brain actually grows and gets denser. You know, we know, we've probably heard of the term neuroplasticity. That yes. means your brain, the wiring of it is changing. So the wiring of your brain changes. And as soon as I understood that, all of a sudden it meant that the tough days were meant to be there. I was working that part of my brain. So then I imagine that part of my brain was like a muscle. So in the sports world, you have the concept of overload. 
which is where you overload your body physically, then you recover and your body gets stronger and is able to cope with more the next time. That's how the principle of the physiology of the body. So it's the same of the brain. Yeah. You overload it. That's why pressure is good. Yeah. Pressure allows you to rewire your brain, to get this part of your brain denser so you can cope with more leading on. However, you need to understand what that pressure is, where it sits, when you have it, mm-hmm. uh, the landscape of it, and then how to recover from it. So that yes. just like training, you can have the overload and recovery principle. So you're always progressing and you're never getting bogged down. I absolutely love that reframe of it's my brain getting stronger. No, or it's that particular part of my brain getting stronger. As yep. as you see an, you know, as you see a potential hurdle or you see a potential problem, you're uh, my, what I'm hearing from what you're saying is you approach it by saying, okay, an opportunity to work that muscle even more so it gets more resilient. Excellent. It's, yeah. And it's it's like, okay, good, I'm having a shit day. Brilliant. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, I was just reading something. Um, it was um, one of the Stoics. And one of the things that they would say uh, when they had a bad day was great, good, a bad day. Yep. Totally. Yeah. No, I swear to God, because if you didn't, and here's the thing that most people think about when they see a professional athlete, they think it's all easy. They think, oh, every day must be great. You're always doing PRs or personal records or whatever it might be. Most days are shit just so you know, most days are shit. And then you have some breakthroughs and then you have some good days and then the percent of that goes up. Um, But by shit, I mean, you know, you're not getting personal records every day by any stretch of the imagination. But what you're doing is you're reframing the different phases of training that you're in and what you're getting out of that specific day. And it's the same with uh, 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 creativity. It's the same with film. It's the same with screenwriting. You know, it's finding, it's being the optimist, right? It's finding the good things in a tough situation. Yeah. What would you, I mean, I was really interested when you said, when you chunk it, you know, okay, I've got two minutes and then I'm going to, I think you said something like shift my mood or change my attitude into this. How do you do that? So when you're working with, when I'm working with, you know, leaders who have got like lots of things going on and, you know, that's going on over here and that's good. The idea of being able to get out of a mood in order to access another one feels very alien. I, we personally believe it's a practice and you've just actually shared that in the way that you've just shared that story, Leslie. But for you, how do you, what's your practice for saying, right, I'm shifting my mood over here and I'm going to change it over here. What do you actually do to do that? Yep. So I I often do a counting pattern. There's many different things that I'll utilize. Normally it's a physical thing, um, but I'll do a, I do a, a countdown. Like I'm at the beginning of a race, I'll do a three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, and that's the change of attitude. So I actually have that in my head. So I have a couple of little things like that that I do, and then if it if it needs more than that. Uh, it might be uh, a piece of music, a piece of film, mm-hmm. a visual aid. Um, it might be a physical behaviour that I do. Uh, it might be walking out the room and back in. Um, we do some breathing exercises. Um, you know, my husband does one that works the phrenic nerves, which calms down the amygdala, um, which is a specific form of breathing. There's a wonderful neuro- neuroscientist uh, called Andrew Huberman. That had a great yes, podcast. yes. And he does a lot of that. I'm sure you know him. He does a lot of that kind of stuff. So just you, you can change your physiology, which will impact your your mental attunement yeah. and your mental application. Yeah. Um, also, as well, I apply these things like alter egos, and um, I'll have triggers for different alter egos that I have depending on the situation. Um, and they're normally those alter egos. You know, say for example, if I'm dealing with a tough. A scenario um, in a meeting, uh, I'm getting frustrated or impatient. You know, I maybe have three or four different people that I um, revere that would have dealt with that situation in a very specific way. And I've watched videos, I've listened to them, and I know their physical or, or like some of their traits that they do, some of their behaviors that they do. And yeah. I maybe mirror some of those behaviors to get them into that alter ego of that specific person 
So I have many different techniques that help me. Really interesting. I think I I either heard you or read about when you were pitching over the 16 years for this film. I think you said there were a couple of opportunity uh, opportunities. I think you went in with your husband, but um, you were told you were smiling too much or, you know, that there was something that was going on in the interaction that actually, yeah. how, so you must have come across some very tricky conversations in the process over the last 16 years. So could you, oh, could yeah. you pull out a specific example, Leslie, where something happened and you pulled out one of these tools that got you back in the game? Gosh, that's a difficult question. Um, I would have said probably maybe even like most recently, for example, at the Oscars, um, you know, obviously we won four Oscars with our film, which was amazing. We did not personally win an Oscar, which was tough uh, as a screenwriter. Um, and so I really had to, I was going down a pretty bad path mm. uh, of just negativity. And so for me, it was about finding uh, the gratitude in the moment. Um, so it was, I do this thing where I really look at the world so I open my eyes and I say a little mantra, open your effing eyes, <laughs> you know? So it's like you're going to open your eyes, you're going to look around and you're going to be aware of the situation and find the gratitude in the moment. Um, so that was certainly something I did during that time. So there's many different kind of like habits I suppose that I use, but for the most part, uh, in the moment, if I'm dealing with something difficult, say in a meeting or where I'm challenged, it's taking a deep breath and standing back um, and trying to put integrity, I suppose, um, and treat people kindly, even if they're not treating. Like, it's almost like the kill people with kindness is a big one for me. Um, because I think if you disarm people, with that, then you know they're 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 either going to back off or they're going to keep going. But you know you've acted with integrity, so you can walk away from the person knowing you've done everything that you could have done. Yeah, yeah, that's a great example, and it's it's actually also being hyper aware that when you feel you're going down that road, what you called it, um, I could feel myself going spiraling down into negativity. Yeah. It's being really yeah. aware of that, isn't it? I suppose it's being right. super alert to when you do that and know, right, right this is when I pull in something. Right. Yeah. Right. And we do this great technique with athletes, in fact, and we've done it with business people too, where, um, oh gosh, what do we call it? I can't remember because we've written a book, uh, The Brave Athlete. Um, it's essentially to do with your limbic system, that yes. part of your your brain that, that is really angry and, and, and primal. And, you know, it's kind of like that screaming child in your head. And, um, and what you do is you, is you let it run riot. So you do think negatively and you are frustrated and you go in the bathroom and you have to do it for a certain amount of time. Like, I think it's uh, maybe three minutes or something like that. Like, a decent amount of time. But negative self-talk, but for a peak, a, like, a long period of time. Until you essentially run out of things to say. And you let rip. You let rip for that three minutes. And what happens is the limbic system actually calms down. Mm. So all of those sort of centers in your brain start to release. And we know that it's almost like the phenomenon when you cry yourself dry. When yeah. you cry, 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 and there's nothing left. It's the same phenomenon. So if you're really spiraling down into that negativity, it's almost like go in your cupboard and let rip for like three minutes. Like I'm not good enough on this and that, blah, 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 blah. And keep on going until you have nothing left to say and you start repeating yourself. Then you know you've exhausted it. Yeah. Of course, that's tough when you're in a meeting, <laughs> you know, if you were to suddenly do that and let it, I mean, I think that's what's so interesting. I mean, we are, you know, the idea of, we call it the dog brain, which is very similar, like when your dog brain is taken control or taken grip, it's like, 
that's the what you've just described to me is the honest approach, right? It's like saying this right. is in my and I'm now letting it out like a like a child that won't stop. You just let it speak mm-hmm. its bit until it. I think what I witness what and, and it happens to me, you know, when when you can't let it out, it then can be very unhelpful because then you say things what I call gut to gob reactions, which are not necessarily helpful. Right. But you end up saying it in disguise almost, um, which cannot necessarily be helpful. So I think this is again where the alter ego can come in, right? If me and Leslie, the person, is having a reaction that I don't want to be visible, I have an ability to put on a character. And it might come across as fake, but if that's all I can do in the moment until I get out of the room and I let that release, yeah. then that's what I do. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty good at, you know, it's 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 a classic. You know, you can even visualize it there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that kind of character. You just you put it on and you fake it. Yes. Yes. It's so interesting, this discussion about faking. I was listening to something the other day saying, you know, you can't fake it. It's it's wrong to fake it till you make it. And I have to say there have been not. moments in my life where actually I've learned so much by faking it and learning actually that I can mm-hmm. do it by faking it and that I wouldn't have known had I not tried it on for size. You know, and also there 100%. are times when you can't, in my view anyway, um, I was a teacher for 13 years with very challenging comprehensive kids. And if I had been truly saying what I what I felt <laughs> in those moments, I probably would have got the sack, Leslie. <clears throat> you know, I had to I had to put on a a, a, a a way of getting through it. And actually, I, I realized by doing that that I could get through those difficult times. It got me through. And actually, I realized right. more about my range than I had right. realized, actually. And we all do it. We all do it every day. We put on a mask. It maybe isn't exactly what we're thinking or feeling in a moment, or we become someone or we become an identity to get through a moment. You know, whether it's as a mother or as a partner or whatever that might be. So that's a very normal phenomenon. Um, but, you know, there is actually science to support some aspects of faking it to make it. There's physio- a physiological response to certain behavioral poses, for example, the Superman pose mm. and so on. You know, that increases testosterone, it reduces cortisol. So there's there's often a neurological reason why that's why this sort of the new science of the neurology of the brain and the impact on the body uh, is is a wonderful new field right because it yeah. actually is you know there's a lot of stuff that that that, that makes sense that actually there's evidence now to support why it works yeah whether you're a fan of the principle of faking it till you make it or not This idea of acting as if features so powerfully here in how Leslie's learnt to deal with adversity. Also in how she remains so tightly connected to her vision and what's possible. In her success both in sport and in film, it's one of the main reasons actually why I became so intrigued with her journey. I want to recap on some of the act as if examples that she's shared so far. Firstly, I love the reframe of, okay, I'm having a shit day, brilliant, what can I learn? I'm definitely going to be more intentional about this. When I next find myself spiraling down on a day that's not going the way I'd anticipated, this is what I'm going to use. This isn't about downplaying the significance of the events, but rather it's about reminding myself that calling them bad and ruminating about them just won't make them any easier to cope with. Instead, why don't I just save my energy for more useful things to focus on? Or as Leslie points out, learn from whatever lesson I can to find the nugget of gold in that tough situation. Secondly, the power of calling on alter egos. To have three or four people who you revere, who you can instantly bring to mind when you need their approach or their energy in a specific situation. Why not? We learn from others all the time. Why not be deliberate about creating a cast of energies from people who inspire you, dead or alive, it really doesn't matter, and ask what they would do in each situation and try that on for size. Be it to become it is perhaps a more enlivening way of saying fake it till you make it. But through Leslie's approach, what she reminds me of, and I hope you too, is that we can surprise ourselves with our own range when we have ways to experiment with energies that perhaps we'd believed weren't truly us. What if it could be you? Talking of which, can you just quickly share 
Leslie, that moment where you had to earn the money you needed to keep the rights. <laughs> and this is the story that really made me think, I have got to speak to this woman. And you were, I think, running through the route of a race that you were about to do the next day or something. Was it in Costa Rica? Is that where you were? I can't remember. Yeah, exactly. so, so I was in Costa Rica and I was cycling. Uh, I was going over the course, basically, really calling the course. Uh, and the type of triathlon I do is all off roads, so it's on trails, on mountain biking. So you're checking out the lines of the course, like it's a rock here, you know, which way do I go down? And I fell off my bike, fell onto my shoulder, and I actually broke it. Not that I knew this at the time, but it was just very sore and I couldn't lift it up. And I was devastated, devastated because we were relying on somebody to pay the option payment for the, for the novel. And um, we had to re up the option every year, that cost us about 10,000 bucks. And we didn't have that kind of money, so my race money was that money. And um, not only that, I was coming back from a lot of illness, and this was the first time I felt good. So there was many things on the line, and yeah, I was just devastated. But then I immediately, after a few tears, sort of tried to figure out what can I do here. And she spoke to Simon and my husband, and he was like, can you ride your bike? I said, I've already tested that. I can kind of put my hand up as long as I don't lift my shoulder up. And anything that's technical on the mountain bike, I'll walk down. Okay, okay. Can you run? I'm like, actually, that and down motion is not a problem. It's just if I lift it, it'd be fine. Okay. Just this one. However, I cannot lift my arms so at all. Uh, my left arm, the one that I'd broken. Uh, but I was very good at the, or I am very good at the one arm drill. Because in swimming, you do a lot of technical training where you're doing drills, you're doing this, you're doing that. So, you know, there's a specific one arm drill uh, that, that's very common, and I'm really good at it. So, um, so I was like, oh, why don't you just try swimming with one arm? I'm like, you know what? Like, What's the worst that can have? Like, get in the water, give it a go. Like, do you know what I mean? Why not? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm not well, no, I don't know what you mean, but yes. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah, but, I you know, I mean, it's just my, my kind of attitude, I suppose. I just can't have a fuck it attitude. It's just a fuck it attitude. Like, just kind of go for it. Like, who cares, you know? Like, what's the worst that can happen? And if you always ask that question, what's the worst that can happen is I get 100 metres out and I have to come back again. Well, at least I've been at a go. I mean, you know, there's nothing worse than not being at a go. So I spoke to my physical therapist, made sure that, you know, as long as I kept it somewhat stable, it wouldn't really make it any worse, right? Yeah. That's my location. So, yeah, I got in the water and um, bloody hell, it was hard. It was 1,500 metres, a mile with one arm. Uh, but, I, but I got out and I was 12 minutes down off the lead. But, you know what? I just didn't care. I was, I was like that. Oh my god! I just won. I love the winner. That was so cool. So, you know, here I'm the streets, like not giving a flying fuck, and just <laughs> kind of having a, almost having a laugh at the ridiculousness of it. Like, give me something ridiculous to do, and I'm gonna have a go. So I got in the water, off I was on my bike, and I started to make time on the leader. Lo and behold, I came off in second position on the bike. <laughs> And uh, and then it ran into first and won the race, so it was like just an absolute lesson of perseverance and dynamic thinking. Wow, what an amazing story! And I'm presuming that as well as, so what's interesting about that is the drills that you had practiced way before this moment, you even knew this moment was going to happen, just kicked in, which right. is fantastic, I think, in terms of that that training. But also, I'm, I'm interested to know how then the the why this project. What year were you on at this point, Leslie? In terms of the 16 years, I think this was about year eight. Oh wow! Okay. How did you no, connect? More than that. It was more than that. Okay. Do yeah. do you do you remember actively connecting to the reason why you were doing this race with one arm in great pain? Or was it more about the the competitive part of you that just needed to just get it, get through it, and do it because it was ridiculous? You know what? What could? Did I think it was both. It was both. It was both. You don't like. I'm not someone. I'm not an overthinker. Let's put it like that. I wasn't sitting there going, "Oh my god, what if?" I'm just like, you know, let's just have a go. Just like have a go. 
Mm-hmm. That's my MO. Like, don't overthink, just do. Because yeah. forward momentum is better than no momentum, even if it's in the wrong direction. You're going to learn something about that. And you're going to say, you know what? Like, it's momentum. Momentum begets momentum. Or if it's in the wrong direction, you say, oh, well, at least I know what the wrong direction is now. But but that it's an energy. It's a form of energy. It's positive. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and and that's what it was about. So I don't think I ever drilled down on what it really meant. I just kind of did. That's, that's how I am. If I yeah. think too much deeply about any one thing, yeah. I kind of I live up here. Yeah. I don't live yeah. down here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Momentum begets momentum. Fab. So what I've, I would love to talk to you briefly about is how do you manage other people's pressure, Leslie? So you, you're, you're putting on a film in a language, a German language, with which I, I really like endorse, cheer and shape with delight that you used actors that were unknown. That I think is amazing. How do you deal with the pressure? Because those actors must have, I mean, that, that was a pretty hardcore film to, to do. How do you manage other people's pressure? It's a good question. I would say every now and again, depending if I'm hungry and tired, then I'll get irritable because they can't they can't operate at my capacity because my capacity to deal with pressure is so high. Um, if I'm not hungry <laughs> and too tired, then I have a lot of compassion. My big thing is compassion that everybody is not like me. And so I always want people to feel good about who they are and where they're at. So it's a no judgment scenario is is where I'm at. And um, I understand that, you know, other people's strengths are my weakness and vice versa. So, yeah, I think it really is just a place of compassion when it comes to other people and how they're dealing with pressure and what that means. Mm hmm. And do you think this whole endeavor, if you, it was there something that you learned through this that you didn't already know about pressure or resilience? Um, to it, it, it really is about the team around you. So if you're going to be able to deal with pressure again and again and again, you want to have a good team that supports you, who you are as a person, and that you support them through theirs. And that's the beauty of what I do. It's collaboration, absolute collaboration. So, and you only really get a good team by giving, giving out. If you're a person that gives out, then you're going to have good people around you. Yeah. As simple as that. And then, and then those people around you are going to make you want a bit too. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I'm interested when you said, you know, if you're tired or you're hungry, that's much harder to bring <laughs> compassion in. So do you really take care? I mean, in the, in the sort of marathon of putting this film on and maybe, I mean, and I'm sure there's many other things that are going on in, in development for you anyway. How do you take care of that? Yep. I, I I am very disciplined about my food. I mean, I have food with me at all times. I have a food bag, I have snacks, I have this, I have that. I plan ahead. I'm a strategic thinker. If I know I am going to, you know, it, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a trip and I know I need to get in my training. I'll make sure there's a gym there. I'll make sure there's equipment there. I'll send things ahead. I'll make sure if we're, we've got a meeting at a restaurant, I look up that restaurant. What types of foods do they have? Is there something that suits me? Do I need to call up the restaurant and make sure they have a gluten-free item? If they don't, I make my own food. Sometimes I'll make my own food anyways, and I'll take it with me. So I have a Tupperware with me just in case. And um, because often, certainly at the moment, you know, we're getting invited out or we're going to people's yeah. houses for dinner. If you don't know when you're getting eaten and what they're going to provide, I always will take something with me because if I don't eat, because I'm an athlete and my yeah. body, my metabolism, like I'm unfunctional if I don't have the right food. So, yeah. and I've had to learn to be a lot more flexible, uh, which has been good for me because I was so disciplined being a, a world champion athlete 
Mm -hmm. Like I've had to learn to pull back. If you get OCD, right? OCD about it. That's you know, again, both the good part of of my discipline and the bad part. Yeah. I get obsessive compulsive about it. Things have to be a certain way, and if they don't, I'm like. Mm. Yeah. So this is this. Yeah, it's just really good to sort of. If I'm in a scenario where it's not going to be perfect, I'm like, it's good for me. It's good for me. You know. I've always been intrigued with film sets, having experienced quite a few of them now. The amount of people involved in creating this finished product, completing it in a specific time frame, the necessity for collaboration and the leadership required to achieve that. More often than not, there are hundreds of people who don't necessarily know each other, who are brought together because of their particular expertise to play their part in creating a compelling story. So Leslie's emphasis on collaboration makes complete sense. But the point that jumped out at me was when she said, you only create a good team by giving out. To collaborate, you have to be prepared to give out to others and that requires you to take care of yourself. For Leslie, there is real discipline around food. She plans ahead because, and I love this description, she's unfunctional if she doesn't eat the right food. Now I know most of us are not champion triathletes, but the relationship that Leslie highlights here, the importance of taking care of yourself to lead others and yourself when the pressure is on, is so, so critical. And that it's often the thing that we most neglect when we're under pressure. Leslie knows that to help others feel good about who they are and where they're at, she wants to show compassion and create a no judgment scenario. We might want to apply this to collaboration in a family team or a friendship team, not just to a professional team. I know I particularly want to create a no judgment scenario with my children and I also know that it's twice as hard if I haven't got into a relationship with myself first. And that for me usually requires rest and giving myself space to choose my state. How many of us in pressure situations are really strategic about what and when to refuel? How many of us prepare and plan for it? I was so struck by this that from now on when someone says to me, I just want more collaboration, I'm going to ask two questions. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, how much are you giving out? And what do you do for you that makes the biggest difference to your capacity to give out? Leslie, I ask two questions to all my guests towards the end, which is, if someone's listening to this podcast and they want to be better under pressure, they want to increase their resilience, what two things would you pay forward to them from your experience? Uh, read Carol Dweck's mindset. I'm not good at this yet. So it's that feeling like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're on a, a forward momentum, forward progression. You are going to be better than this. That's the point. Um, and then... Um, it's a workout. It's a brain workout. Think of it as a brain workout. So it's always something positive that can be garnered from a tough situation. You're literally building your brain to be stronger for the next time. Marvellous. Leslie, it's an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so, so much for um, agreeing to talk. It's been fantastic. Pleasure, Sarah. And best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.